Hello, and welcome to another Witch Please bonus Patreon exclusive interview. I'm Marcel Cosman. Hannah is not here. She's in Bali, so she's not going to join us because she's taking a honest to God real life vacation. But I am joined. I, <laughs> I forgot how to finish that sentence. I couldn't remember if it was by or with. I am joined. My name? I Yeah, I forgot your name. <laughs> I am joined by a very dear friend of mine who we already established uh, our friendship is dang close to two decades. Oh, boy. Um, my, my dear friend, Michelle Thompson. Hello, Michelle. Hi, Marcel. How are you? I'm so good. I'm really, really glad that we're going to sit down and talk about some Harry Potter stuff, which you and I don't normally talk about very much. No, we really don't. So this is this is this is very exciting. Um, so I I asked Michelle to come on and chat with me about the new Harry Potter. Um, no, sorry, it's not a Harry Potter video game. <laughs> it is Hogwarts. Hogwarts. Legacy. Legacy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the reason that I asked Michelle to come on and talk about it is one, because Michelle's the only gamer who I actually love and respect. And Yikes. um Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bigotry. just joking. No, she's <laughs> intra fandom, you know, <laughs> competition. <laughs> like some nerd some nerd culture is okay and other nerd culture is not. It turns out I'm a real snob. No, I'm not. I'm just joking. <laughs> Um, no, I just don't know any gamers. And uh, and also, Michelle and I had this incredible, like, real phone conversation, like, a week ago, where she was filling me in on everything that was happening in the universe of of gaming to do with this with this new game because I haven't been following it because I don't I don't I only know how to play the Lego games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like you and I are two um, like dignitaries from neighboring kingdoms trying to work out <laughs> a weird crossover <laughs> event that has like blown up both of our of our domains. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> we like don't quite inhabit each other's cultural worlds, but we're trying to like hash out what is happening here. Definitely. So okay, so for so for clarity, Michelle, you have not played the game. Right? No, no, no. I I haven't played the game. And so in this conversation, I'm going to be pretty careful about trying to draw conclusions about like plot beats that are in the game or Mm -hmm. in game representations of certain things because I haven't played it and I haven't watched it streamed or anything. Um, Mm -hmm. And also, to be honest, I don't have the lore knowledge of Harry Potter to be able to make really like nuanced, informed Mm. reads of those things anyway. So mm-hmm. I'm coming to this more as someone who plays a lot of games, really cares about this medium, reads mm-hmm. a lot of news, and is highly online, which is where <laughs> a lot of things have been happening. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I hear. Okay. Okay. So even though I know we had a whole conversation about this, we're just going to imagine that I know nothing because frankly, that is how much <laughs> I'm able to retain of any in-depth conversation. So start me from the beginning, okay? What is it? Sure. And what's going on? Okay. So Hogwarts Legacy is a open world RPG that released on February 10th. It was produced by Avalanche Software And it's sort of important because I think it's safe to say it's sort of the first attempt that has ever been made to make a game that stands in the expanded Harry Potter universe or the Wizarding World or whatever we're calling it, that Mm -hmm. is like for adults, kind of, that's not like Mm. the Lego games are designed to be really accessible and really beginner friendly. They're Mm -hmm. very much like embracing people who don't play a lot of games or like play with your kids or your younger cousins (laughs) you know like yeah and there were some games that were made as like movie tie-ins that were kind of like throwaway products so Mm. there's a huge number of gamers who love harry potter huge crossover even though that's neither of us and 
have been dying for like a big high budget. Like, let me run around in Hogwarts. Mm. Let me be a character. Let me be in the world. Let me build relationships. Let Mm -hmm. me use a wand and be creative and do magic. And that was the pitch for this game. It was supposed to be all of those things. Okay. It sounds like there's a lot of opportunity there for a very successful game. Is that is that what's happening? <laughs> so that <laughs> is hotly under contention. So mm. this game has had some of the most polarizing reviews I have ever seen on a title. I'm talking like among major games media outlets. It got a 9 out of 10 on the first day reviews were available from IGN. A couple of days later, it gets a one out of 10, which I have never seen before in all of my days mm-hmm. um, from, I think it was Wired. And, you know, we can get into the reasons why some of that happened. But basically over the last couple of months and really culminating in the couple of days leading up to its release and then the week or week and a half after that, mm-hmm. this was like the biggest topic in the gaming space. And I think... okay. What's part of what's interesting to me about this is I think it's like an opportunity to read some of the issues that are going on in the Harry Potter world, but through the lens Mm -hmm. of games and like the cultural issues that we have, you know? Okay. So, okay. So, um, I know that there are lots of people who are calling for a boycott of the game because of, because, because, JK Rowling is a transphobe and because she profits financially from the yep. game is what to so okay so I know that I also know that she is not involved in the game and that Warner Brothers like really went out of its way to try to to try to distance this yes. game from her so how's that kind of playing <laughs> how's that going how's that going <laughs> So this is the stuff that gets so interesting to me. So Rowling has not been directly involved herself. However, her production company is. So Mm. we still have a material pipeline that goes there. And that's been one of the big driving forces in the calls for a boycott. Mm -hmm. I mean, also, some people are just making the argument that, like, at this point, anything we do and engage with a platform that extends the legacy of the series is in some way an endorsement of of Mm. Rowling. And there's there's some there's something to that argument, I think. But also there's a lot else going on here. So <laughs> are you are you saying there are other issues with the I game? literally my brain is reeling trying to pick which one to start on in response to this comment. <laughs> okay, so I mean okay. I think one of the things that has emerged as a really interesting element of this for me is that I think for, especially for kind of like lay people who aren't like incredibly deep in the, the Potter fandom, Mm -hmm. I think there's a perception that like the, the world itself, the wizarding world, the franchise itself is still sort of a valuable and good asset that it basically Mm -hmm. has sort of liberal humanist values and that the direction that Joanne has gone is kind of like a scar on the face of something very worthy underneath. Right. Yes. That otherwise it would be. Yes. No, no, no. Yeah. (laughs) I'm sure that very informed people and I'm reading between the lines would like have their own interpretations of whether that's valid. But I think that's the narrative. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's come out in this in the development of this game is that like, what if actually now because of her legacy, the people who want to work on Wizarding World products going forward are people who are responding to and extending the worst parts of her belief system. Mm. So, for example, this game goes into development in 2017. It gets announced uh, only a couple years after that. But, you know, you you know the Rowling timeline better than I do. But from what I know, Mm -hmm. 2018 to 2020 is sort of when we start really being aware of the bad trans stuff, right? Yeah, like her... So her shitty politics start to become text instead of subtext around around that time and by text i mean she literally starts publishing things that are (laughs) real shitty and um and i think that like i think she goes i want to say she goes full turf 
in January of 2020 because, okay. and the reason I remember this is because we, ha- Hannah and I had agreed to um, reboot this podcast and all of a sudden Joanne has gone like full blown, <laughs> right. full blown, I, this is the hill I choose to die on. And we right. had to have a serious conversation about whether we wanted to make a Harry Potter podcast right. in light of, in light right. of, um, she who must not be named. <laughs> so, so yeah. Yeah. So, so in the early stage of this, of this development cycle, and I mean, games this big, it's very normal for it to take like five years for a game this large to come out. That's not okay. in and of itself anything concerning. Okay. But, you know, over that 2018 to 2020 arc, this studio starts losing people and people weren't really sure why at the time. It really looks in retrospect like a lot of people who were in early development on this game ended up having issues with whether they wanted to continue to mm. work on this franchise. There's some loose anecdotal evidence that that was going on. I don't want to hit that point too hard because it is a bit mm-hmm. speculative. But mm-hmm. one thing we do know is that the lead designer on this game, who was a man named Troy Leavitt, got outed in late 2021 for a bunch of Gamergate videos that he made when that was all going on. Mm. Speaking in defense of the harassment campaigns that were brought against a bunch of really prominent female gender nonconforming and uh, generally progressive game developers and journalists. Um, I'm going to assume everybody kind of knows what Gamergate was. Um, You can probably, a very cursory Google search will tell you a lot about that if you're not sure. (laughs) Basically, this is like, this is the seed of so many battles that are still going on today in the games community. It's also one of the major cultural events that sort of launched the contemporary alt-right as we know it. And so... What? Okay, whoa. (laughs) I Listen, there's there's a real substantial... That that comment was not made glibly. There is a well-documented historical legacy of how Gamergate was one of the major launching pads of the contemporary oh alt-right. And gaming spaces continue to be one of the most fruitful recruiting and hunting grounds oh for people who are looking to recruit particularly disillusioned young men into white supremacist spaces and alt-right, um, radical fascist spaces. There's a lot being done about this. That's, <laughs> listen, have, have yeah. me back or after this is done, I'll tell you all about it. I have so much to say about this. Okay. Anyway, so we find out that the guy who's making the Wizarding World game is Mm -hmm. a a gamer gator. So he quickly gets shown the door. Warner Brothers swoops in, makes this big public statement to fans saying, like, we're we're as shocked as you are. Don't worry. We're making (laughs) sure that, like, yeah. Shocked. (laughs) Sorry. No trace of this guy. They literally say something to... I don't have the direct quote in front of me, but something to the effect of, like, we will... No imprint of Troy's politics will be in this game at the time that it ships. We will Mm. return to this point later in Mm -hmm. this conversation. So that happens. People are still pretty concerned about that because honestly, late 2021 in a game that's supposed to ship at end of 2022 is like, that is when a lot of the big creative decisions in a game have already been made. You're you're out Mm. of pre-production and well into production at that point. So yeah, there's some other stuff too. It comes out that like one of the uh, voice actors is is cozying up to Rowling on Twitter, Greg Ellis. Uh, he's a very infamous men's right activist who was at the forefront of the harassment and smear campaign around Amber Heard. So already we're starting and he's in the game that shipped. So like, you know, uh, to what extent are we concerned about who is still working on this game we're still a little bit concerned and so you know there's a series of content decisions that we we can talk about if you want to but it it's really left me with the question like what if jk may have been the biggest problem in the past but what if she's not their biggest problem for this franchise going forward right right what if the people who are drawn to this now are actually people who want to nurture that element of what's going on um that doesn't seem impossible right because i feel like for the sorry by doesn't mean doesn't seem impossible what i really mean is um that makes logical sense to me because the folks who 
seem to be the most like hurt and disillusioned and trying to find a way forward, like post post turf gate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it like those those tend to be folks who like who were into this world because it seemed like it had all of these options and all of this like imaginative potential Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, once the dominoes start falling and you start to realize like, like, Oh, well, what other kinds of politics, like what other kinds of hateful politics are actually built into this world? It makes sense then that the folks who are still committed to, committed to expanding and nurturing the world, despite transphobia, would also be into other types of hateful shit. So, yeah. Anyway. This or, at, is, or at the least, yeah. maybe like indifferent enough that they don't see it and are very comfortable replicating and playing creatively in the spaces where, like, for example, anti-Semitism is a major influencing factor in, in the narrative. And like mm-hmm. maybe some of the people who worked on this and designed it are like real vocal anti-Semites. But a lot of them are probably like libs who think of themselves as nice people and just like aren't that aware of it and like aren't would be like, it's not that deep. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I think it raises some really, you know, this is the first major original canonical cultural object in the wizarding world since the last Fantastic Beasts movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess since I don't know what the canonical status is of the like wizarding world uh, theme park things, but this is sort of like the biggest step off the the beaten path I think that they've taken in mm-hmm. canon so far, and it's I think it'll be it's it'll be really interesting to see what the legacy of this game is. Not to try to be cute about that, yeah. Don't make that face <laughs> at me, Marcel. <laughs> okay, Michelle, I have I have a very serious question. It's I I mean it's as it's as serious as all of my questions, uh, which is pretty pretty um muddled and hard to hard to actually put <laughs> into words. One of the things that we talked about when you and I had our phone conversation that I thought was really, really interesting, and I would love for you to touch on again, is um the the review system. So yes. so because so because I don't because I, I don't know anything about this universe, I learned from you that when a new game is coming out, major like gaming news outlets get advanced copies in order to have reviews ready for the release day. That's right. Because, you know, games are games are long. I think this one is between 40 and 60 hours to play. So you can't, it's not like an episode of TV, right? That you can watch mm-hmm. in an hour and write a review. So it's really common for, um, I mean, I would say for any game that has like this size of a budget behind it, any game that has any kind of marketing budget, which like I'm sure everyone's seen the ads for this game, like this game mm-hmm. has marketing money. They are sending out review copies to every major gaming publication and tons of people in like the influencer space, like Twitch streamers and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So Typically, a game outlet would get this free review copy between a couple of days or a week if it's a short game to like a couple of weeks sometimes if it's a longer game in advance Mm. of the release. And so the way they control information flow about the game from there is they have what's called an embargo date. Typically, this is between one and three days before the release date of this game. Mm -hmm. And basically, when they've sent out review copies... It's the day before which no one who has the game is allowed to talk about what's in the game. So embargo date becomes the date that everyone is trying to hit with their review. So Mm -hmm. in this case, the embargo date was February 6th. Release date was was February 10th. So embargoes are a really big deal in games journalism, first of all. Basically, all of the game's media journalism space happens online, and a lot of it happens just among the sort of top 10 most popular websites. Like, you, we are not a space that is, like, well-served by conventional media. Like, any of the places that typically review, like, movies and books and music and theater, 
They do not cover us. And when they do, we are like, Jesus, what are you? Please hire somebody (laughs) who knows what they're talking about. Don't believe anything printed about us in the New York Times. That's rule number one. Okay. So we're, we're overwhelmingly like an online news space. And so I can't even express to you how important it is for the survival of the main news websites to have their reviews go up on the embargo date. Reviews do exponentially higher traffic and higher ad revenue than other kinds of articles. And Mm. the vast, vast, vast majority of that traffic is going to hit within about the 36 hours after an embargo window drops or on the day of the release. So super important to hit embargo date to the point where a lot of outlets, if they think they're not going to be able to hit the embargo day, just don't bother putting in the staff labor to review certain games. Whoa. Okay. Because it becomes just not worth the time sink to have one of your guys playing some game for a hundred hours when they could be writing 50 other articles in that time. Right. Okay. So okay. that means the politics around getting review copies can get intense. Again, like, Every big game goes to every big outlet, period. So when Embargo Day drops on Hogwarts Legacy, there's there's we have sort of the equivalent of like Rotten Tomatoes, like an aggregator that takes all the scores and like collates them into one. Ours is called Open Critic or Metacritic. They're two sites with slightly different algorithms. So people are like on Metacritic on Embargo Day and they're like, oh my God, this game's got an 89. That's crazy. Like for context, anything with a 90 is going to be like in the conversation for game of the year. Like that is mm. high, especially mm-hmm. because people were suspecting that th- there was some reason to be worried about this game in the lead you, up. You did name a, a a couple of a couple of things that seemed concerning. Yeah, there was like some gameplay <laughs> footage that didn't look totally right. And there, mm. there was just some stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. So people start looking around and pretty quickly they notice that like of the big game sites like IGN, Kotaku, Polygon, uh, Rock, Paper, Shotgun, a couple of others, the only big one that has its review up is IGN, which happens to have given the game a 9 out of 10. People quickly start digging in and it turns out there is a very, very linear pattern between who was covering the discussion about boycotting the game that was going on in the community, and who got a review copy in time to hit the embargo date. So these other games, including Polygon, Kotaku, like big, big ones, Mm -hmm. did not get review copies in time to hit that date. That is a lot. Like for that to be that clear and that brazen is Mm -hmm. like a violation of protocol like in our our space. Like that, that can't be accidental. Is that right? Like it can't be accidental. Like the 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 Venn diagram of outlets that were covering potential boycott and also didn't get advanced copies in time for the embargo date. Like that's a perfect circle, and that can't I mean, be I, maybe I not a perfect circle. But it's close. Like it's yeah. it's the data is persuasive when you see mm-hmm. it. Is what I would say, mm-hmm. and it also extends to a lot of influencers as well a lot of queer influencers were not getting this game unless they Mm. were ones that were really vocally on side with continuing to cover harry potter stuff Mm. so it sparked this really intense sort of blowback which partially was about like the ethics of whether these outlets should be publishing reviews and promoting and platforming Mm. this game you know, so not just moving that conversation from like the consumer behavior to the to the media coverage level. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Wired only gets theirs up a couple of days later. They give it a one out of 10, which I have never seen before. Whoa. To be fair, the review, the text of the review is written like about a seven. But at the end, they say one out of 10, don't give your money to don't support Rowling. And instead of a link to where to buy it, they put a link to Trans Lifeline. So there's a lot of that kind of behavior going on. There's a lot of outlets like choosing to cover it, but put in a a pretty annoying paragraph about like, I hope my trans friends aren't mad at me for doing this, which is like, not I don't think trans people's favorite way that that could be dealt with. Yeah, it seems seems like they could make the writer could have made a different choice. So here's the thing. I think there's 
a range of defensible positions on the question of whether to review this game. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the most persuasive positions I have seen is from Gita Jackson, uh, who wrote the review for Polygon, which came out Mm -hmm. uh, just February 17th, so fully 11 days after embargo, which Mm -hmm. I think is excellent. Um, Gita is a non-binary brown person who has loved Harry Potter since the day it came out, and I think writes Mm -hmm. a really balanced contextualized review but their perspective is like have you seen the marketing budget on this thing like it's literally impossible for like a freelance games writer to platform a game of this size like Mm. let's Mm -hmm. be for real for a minute so there's been just like a lot of hurt feelings and then by the time this hits the influencer space people streaming it on twitch people starting to talk about it it spawns a whole other wild set of of anecdotes. Like this thing just, it was for a while, it was like multiple times every day. There was a new thing on Twitter that had happened in relation to this game. New facts coming out about content, new things that happened in the community. Like it just, it would not stop happening. It was like two straight weeks of like, this game just kept happening. Oh, it was wow. unbelievable. <laughs> So even though you haven't played it, do you feel like you've played it? I mean, so kind of, but I don't think for the reasons that you're that you're guessing. So okay, there's been a, f- a fair bit of conversation covering content that's in the game. So I feel like I have a pretty good handle on what the story is. Mm-hmm. But honestly, like I've played so many games like this at this time in my life that like it has to have more than just like an okay story for me Mm. to bother. And everything I've heard about the actual gameplay in this is that it's like a painted over game from the early 2010s, which Mm. is like not what I'm looking for. So I feel Mm -hmm. like I can just, one of the funny points that Gita makes also in their review is that the first spell that you learn basically just turns your wand into a gun, which is so funny to me. Like, you know, it was like, there's barely a point to learning any other spells because your wand just goes like, bang, bang, bang. And I'm like, I don't need to play this. I'm not the audience for this, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So, okay. I mean, this is also, so this seems really interesting to me because I, this is, this is based exclusively on feelings and nothing else. But I feel like the majority of us who are mourning the um the loss of this universe and who would have loved to have some kind of some kind of role playing game where we get to be in the world i suspect that we would not be satisfied with a first person shooter but where you have a wand instead of a instead <laughs> right. of a gun like this is it's i'm making some assumptions here but i'm just i'm just guessing like like for me it is it is almost a relief to hear that this is largely like what the game is because the, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I, I am not, fe- I am not feeling FOMO for this game. <laughs> no, you're fine. So, I mean, it's set in the 1890s, so it's not, mo- it's not going forward in time. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the early things that I was seeing in conversation on Twitter Everyone was mad about this game for a different reason for a very long Mm. period. But Mm -hmm. one of them that I saw was actually from people who still, even if they had complex feelings about the franchise, had love in their hearts for it, Mm -hmm. who were asking really interesting questions of the developers. Like, for example, given that open world RPGs tend to be really choice driven narratives where you really get to make a lot of decisions about who your character is and how you want to play them and how you want to behave and relate to people. Mm-hmm. Can you use the unforgivable curses in this game? Is that the right term? That is the right okay, term. Okay, great. Yes. Great. So this question was um, put to um, the the one of the lead developers, the lead designer, Kelly Rowland, by Games Radar. And she gave a really interesting quote. I'm going to just read part of it for you. Mm-hmm. Characters will react vis- visually and audibly to seeing the player cast an unforgivable, but we don't have a morality system that punishes them for doing so. Um, this is because it is the ultimate embodiment of role-playing, allowing the player to be evil. 
Additionally, this was important to us because it comes from a place of non-judgment by the game creators. If you want to be evil, be evil. So I, I saw some people who were invested in the lore. And, you know, this being sort of like a prequel in some ways, mm -hmm. like, I feel like lore is one of the major reasons you would go to this, which is like, okay, what was <laughs> Hogwarts before? And yeah. people were very frustrated by the idea that, like, everyone... So people like tisk tisk you for doing like the killing curse and then you move basically move on with your day. People are like, oh, I wish you hadn't done that. Well, we still have to work together to put down this goblin rebellion. Off we go. Like, that's weird. That's oh weird. God. That is very that is extremely weird. And also, can we talk about the fact that the point of the game is to put down a goblin rebellion? We can't. So I know I started by saying I'm not going to talk about the content of the game, but we do <laughs> have to talk a little bit about the content of this game. Just a little bit. Because, okay, I so a friend of mine sent me a message bef before the game had been released, basically saying, like, have you heard about what's going on with this game? Because it seems hella anti-Semitic. And I was like, I don't know what's going on with this game. And I didn't think about it at all afterwards. And then I read, uh, I read like one of the, I think a Twitter link that you sent me where the, where the, the writer was like, one of the goblin artifacts is a shofar stuffed with, with trafe. It's like a show, it's a, it's a, it's a ritual object that's been desecrated. <laughs> yeah. And the description of it is like a horn that goblins use to annoy the wizards. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> also there's like the major plot is like maybe kind of a reference to blood libel which is like a little bit rough okay so let me i'm gonna read you just like the shortest summary of the game's plot again mm -hmm. from that gita jackson review in polygon okay you're also up against the evil goblin ranrock and his wizard ally rookwood these names marcel i don't know how you do this Mm -mm. Ranrock's <laughs> motives are pretty clear. After a wizard committed a vicious hate crime against him, he became prejudiced against all wizard kind and is trying to lead a rebellion of goblins to start a war. Though the goblins you meet pointedly say that they think Ranrock has gone too far with his methods. <laughs> oh my god. Why Rookwood is there is never all that clear. By the end of the <laughs> game, I still had no idea what Rookwood wanted or why he was working with Ranrock or what they had planned to do with a mass with the huge cache of magical power, they were unearthing together. So <laughs> this is where some of the, like, maybe blood libel stuff happens, which is that, okay, so this game... Oh, boy. And, like, you're going to have to be patient with me if I'm, like, butchering the lore a little bit. But basically, this game invents a new type of magic for sentient creatures, I guess, to have. So as I understand it, human magic, like, is innate and it's, like, hereditary. So there's this other kind of magic called ancient magic that manifests in the body and it has like a, a physical essence that like hmm. causes it. And so I guess one of the plots is that Ranrock, your uh, goblin, mm -hmm. is working with a professor to like kidnap students from Hogwarts and extract that substance from them Gross. and like store it in vats <laughs> and like use it for stuff. Anyway. Basically, the plot of this is putting down a slave uprising. And like, I don't, I don't know. I, I think I can go on record and say, this is an unpopular opinion. I'm for slave uprisings <laughs> and not for putting them down. That doesn't sound heroic, although it does sound historically accurate to 1890s Touché. Britain. Yes, But sure. I don't think that's what this game is doing because this game also goes so far out of its way from what I understand. Again, go read Gita. They played mm -hmm. it. I didn't. But like, there's characters from India casually in this game. India's still very much like under British colonial rule at this period. Yeah. There's like, it, it's so weird. It's like it's trying to do this like liberal compensating for some of the politics of of Rowling thing, mm -hmm. but in a way that just never seems to quite land for people. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Like, what we're left with is just this weird culture war object where. You know, there are some people committed to talking about what's actually in the game or like the material circumstances of how it got made. And then other than that, there's just people yelling at everyone else to just like shut up and get politics out of games, which 
I've heard more <laughs> get politics out of games in the last two weeks than I have in a long time. And like, wow. I'm sure your listeners are smart. I'm sure they can think through some of the reasons why get politics out of this art medium is like mm -hmm. not a very good argument. Uh, it's like you can not Google a great first take. <laughs> It's not a good take. Like you can like quickly <laughs> Google first person shooter military recruitment if you would like to learn more about one of the many <laughs> ways that like some of the most popular and important games of the last few years were like Disco Elysium, which is about being in a failed post-communist like Eastern Bloc uh, state where like nothing politically feels possible. Like this is just a, a profoundly ignorant and foolish and absolutely wild thing to say about this medium mm -hmm. even if all you play is like call of duty oh, <laughs> you're in such danger of me talking about this for another hour and a half straight we're right on the cusp <laughs> okay 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 i do i i love it and i wish we could but we can't because we respect coach and we, yeah. we want her to stay with us forever i i feel though that we would be remiss if we didn't even mention briefly our our token trans character who was parachuted into the game more or less oh, at the last minute. I to can't quell, believe we managed to, to not quell talk the about angry this. queers. <laughs> so this is the first time I've ever heard someone be misgendered by their chosen name. Mm -hmm. um, the the trans character's name, which was very much added at the eleventh hour, it once word of a boycott had already gained momentum is named Serona Ryan, which doesn't hear, sound that bad when you hear it, but it is spelled S-I-R-O-N-A, Ryan. It just, it looks, it's just awful. It's, <laughs> like it's it, just... Icky is the only term that I can think of for, like, choosing this as the, as the, as, as your, as your, is your queer or trans character's name? It's just awful. It, it, I mean, it did spawn an entire genre of parody mm -hmm. tweets, which was like very fun for a couple of days of people being yes. like, "What's your Harry Potter name?" And based on your like ethnicity and sexual right. orientation, it was like, yeah. The best one I saw is like a Jewish bisexual named Dreidel both ways, which I think mm -hmm. is actually how we started this conversation. I think so. Yeah, yeah. This seems good and right. <laughs> And we end on that as well. <laughs> There's so much oh, interesting boy. to read about this. Um, if you want to hear more about all this and what people are talking about, Jason Schreier, who's an excellent games reporter, has a piece in Bloomberg.ca, um, which was published on February 9th, that talks about some of people's reservations and where the conversation was leading up to the release. Like I said, Gita Jackson's review on Polygon is really excellent at putting this game in context from the position of someone who has affection for this franchise. So that will probably mm -hmm. resonate with your listeners. Mm -hmm. And if you just want to see like where some trans people's head is at, Stephanie Sterling, who is someone who still uses their um, their pre-transition name in their in their online handles, which is mm -hmm. at Jim Sterling, has a YouTube video that's just like a state of the union on like where trans people are at in this whole thing, which is beautiful. Great. It's really yeah. great. Awesome. Michelle, I am tremendously grateful that you took time from your Saturday night to hang out with me and talk about this absolute shit show of a, uh, of a, of a game. <laughs> this was so fun. Thank you for just like, this is like bloodletting for me. Like it's just like letting out <laughs> the ghosts in my brain that won't stop talking to me about this. So thank you so much for letting me let all this out. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Michelle, do you want to do you want to plug your podcast? Can listeners still find it if they're like, wow, this chick seems smart. I'd like to hear her talk about games some more. For the zero to one of you who reached that conclusion, um, I had a podcast about video games that I did as an early pandemic project with my partner, it's called Never Was a Gamer. Um, you can find it at neverwasagamer.com. It's about like my weird journey to coming into this community and like falling in love with something silly and frivolous as an adult and sort of re retaking control of like my right to have like play and, and mm -hmm. like joy in my adult life. It's pretty fun. It ended last year, but it's all still there. I think a lot of our listeners would be into that, well, whether they're gamers or not. It sounds great. I'm not I'm not I don't it's part of my uh, aesthetic I don't listen to podcasts so I'm, a I'm actually just person. not a good friend 
you and I respectfully support each other's podcasts and have never listened to them. And I love that for us. I do. I love it. I love it. Let us let us model this. (laughs) This like I love that for you, kind of. (laughs) Yeah, sincerely. (laughs) Okay. Thank you so much.